Welcome everyone. Welcome to Heart Shift Radio. I'm, of course, uh, Marcy Newman, your host, and we are here with a very, very special program today. First off, you may see my guest and notice that there is a family resemblance. And that's because I have with me today my littlest brother, Tiger Schmittendorf. And we are here on this very special occasion. I'm not certain that I should say celebrating. So I think I will say this day of honoring, honoring our frontline workers on this international day for first responders. Now, this is the first anniversary. This day was put aside by Congress just last year. So it's its first anniversary. You might say its first birthday. And yet I noticed as I was perusing all of the um, news media today that there was very little mention of it. And I have to say, I sort of gasped at that knowing how much these first responders have given to us in this past year, it almost was too much for me to take in that there wasn't more being done to honor them. And so I'm here, I guess, maybe in a form of protest but really to honor all those who work so tirelessly for us. And when I was thinking about it, to tell you the truth, I couldn't think of a more deserving person than my own brother. So first off, Tig, let me welcome you and tell you how happy I am, how honored I am, and really thrilled that you are here to share everything that you bring to the table about being a first responder. So welcome. Thanks, Mars. It's pretty cool that uh, we get to do this for the first time. You have your podcast. I have a couple of podcasts I'm involved in, and now we get to do one together. So it's a great subject, too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. And, you know, how wonderful um, that this, of course, will be the first of many, because my heart is so much connected to what you do and who you are in this world. So I want to share a little bit more about your background so that the rest of our audience knows just why I selected you today. It wasn't just because you're my favorite youngest brother. Yeah, right. All right. <laughs> so Tig is Vice President of Strategic Services for First Arriving which is a full service marketing team supporting the public safety community. He served the Erie County Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Services in Buffalo, New York for more than 20 years before retiring as retiring as deputy fire. Retiring. <laughs> yes, <laughs> retiring <laughs> as taking on his new position of deputy fire coordinator in 2018. There he was responsible for the recruitment, training and mutual aid operations of the county's 97 fire departments and 6,000 plus firefighters. He created a recruitment effort that doubled his own fire department's membership and helped net thousands of new volunteers countrywide. A frequent presenter on leadership, incident management, connecting generations and recruitment and retention. He is nationally certified fire instructor and has been a firefighter since 1980. And of course, there are a multitude of websites where you can connect with him and I will make certain that they are all right here so that you know how to get in touch with him directly. But I have to share with you um, my first memories of Tig's involvement with the fire department. And then Tig, I'm gonna ask you to share um, a little bit 
about how you got started and without divulging your age, mm -hmm. I can remember so many years ago when you were just this tiny little boy. And the moment that that fire whistle would go off, you would be on your bike and faster than anybody could even blink an eye. You were on your way to the fire station to see what was going on. Whenever we couldn't find you, whenever it was time for dinner and nobody seemed to know where you were, whenever there was something else that you were supposed to be doing and you were nowhere to be found, we knew that it was a safe bet that you were at the fire station. And when I say a tiny little boy, I mean it. He was so young. And probably the moment that he learned how to ride a bike, he was beating that path from our house to the station. So Tig, can you tell our audience your version of how that started? <laughs> Well, it's, um, I don't know how far back my memories go, but I do know they date back at least until I was probably, you know, 12 or 14 years old. Um, you know, I, in many of my classes that I teach, I, I tell the story of, of growing up in a neighborhood where we had 21 kids across three households. And, um, you know, I'm the youngest of eight, Lattimore's had nine and and I say we called the Milks family the poor family because they only had four kids, but <laughs> you know, we lent them kids all the time. So uh, that was OK. But um, from probably about the time I was 14 or so, uh, whenever that fire siren went off, I either rode my bike to the fire station to open the doors uh, for the firefighters to you know, get out quicker or um, what happened a little later was uh, myself, John Lattimore, and Doug Milks, whenever that fire siren would go off, we'd run to the end of the street. Um, and the chief at the time, Jim Gennetti, would pick us up in his pickup truck and take us to fire calls. <laughs> and um, we did that for a long time. And uh, because we were going to so many calls and probably doing far more than we were supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. uh, eventually they actually created uh, a junior fire company. I remember and, that. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we still haven't figured out whether it was more for their protection or ours. Uh, but uh, I'm proud to say that I was Evan Center's first ever junior firefighter. Wow. And then, uh, and at the time, John and Doug weren't even old enough to be junior firefighters. So <laughs> um, they followed uh, behind me. But uh, I was only in that position for about three or four months before I turned 18 and became a full-fledged firefighter. Um, but one of the things that I'm so blessed with is uh, that Chief Jim Gennetti, who's been driving me to fire calls since I was 14 years old, is still driving me to fire calls. Oh. Just had lunch with him today. Um, we have what we call our day shift lunch, which is mostly retirees and uh, uh, other people who are around during the day to respond to calls to our uh, volunteer fire department. Um, but he's our primary driver. And uh, more often than not, I get to ride the front right seat, uh, which is the officer's position, although I'm not no longer a, a formal officer, uh, but uh, we still get to do that together and, and we know how fortunate we are to still be able to enjoy doing that. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. Um, it's also so remarkable that um, you've been doing this for so many years, number one, and number two, what a perfect example it is for finding your passion and just letting it lead your life. And I think that you've done such a remarkable job of doing that. I'm sure that there were other times where maybe, you know, <clears throat> you were tempted to go in other directions. Um, I know how talented you are in so many ways. And of course, many other things may have been more lucrative at the time. And yet you knew so clearly at such a young age that this is really what fed your spirit and gave you the opportunity to feel the most connected um, to this earth and to humanity and really so clear about your purpose. And that's what's really remarkable. And um, I'll tell you something, it's, it's something that is 
I think missing in, in so many people's lives. Um, and we're going to talk more about that, you know, that, that um, how important it is to find that connection and that life's purpose and to just commit to it, be loyal to it. Um, and also the ramifications of feeling that sense of separation, because I know that that's something that you experience also in your community, um, particularly because of what you are facing every time you go out the door to do your work. So first off, I think for the audience, we need to know what's on your hat and what's on your shirt because if they're anything like me, I can't see it. And I know that it has significance to you. Uh, first and foremost, the logo on my shirt, and I wear this uh, most often when I do podcasts, but it uh, it's the logo for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, uh, which the website for that is firehero.org. Um, and their logo is uh, a Maltese cross uh, with a flower inside of it. And, um, that's how we remember, uh, our fallen and our, uh, fellow firefighters. And, um, I've been blessed for the last 10 years to be involved with the national fallen firefighters foundation as the director of their hero tribute project, which the national fallen firefighters memorial is in Emmitsburg, Maryland at the site of the national fire Academy and the National Emergency Management Institute. Um, and um, the Memorial Weekend is typically the uh, first weekend in October. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we could not hold that Memorial Weekend live um, because of COVID this year, uh, but they were able to uh, still bring honor to those who uh, fell in the line of duty in the previous year. Um, but as the director of their Hero Tribute Project, um, I'm tasked with uh, interviewing and capturing and sharing the stories of fallen firefighters through um, their families, their survivors, and uh, also their fellow firefighters and their friends. And um, uh, I honestly consider it the greatest honor I've ever received in my 40 years in the fire service um, that I was the one chosen to be their storyteller. And uh, that's something that I carry with me every day. Um, I also refer to it as a tremendous honor, but a daunting task. Yes. Um, because of the stories that are shared and um, what's important about their stories is we don't focus on how their firefighter was lost, but most importantly, how they lived, because those are the most important stories. And you talk about what's missing in our society today and that, and that uh, sense of selfless service. Um, those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for their communities and their country are certainly the ones who exemplify selfless service the most. So um, on my hat is the logo for uh, my company first arriving, which I'm a vice president and a partner in. Uh, we're headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. Um, but you mentioned earlier how, you know, I always saw the fire service as my life passion, and that's very true. Um, but early on, I didn't see it as a career path. Um, maybe because I didn't think I was, you know, physically built for it, or I just didn't, you know, there were really limited opportunities in our area outside of the volunteer fire service to actually get a paid career in, in, um, firefighting. And, um, so I knew from the time I was 14, I wanted to, wanted to be an engineer. I went to Milwaukee School of Engineering, a strict engineering school. Um, and I spent my first 15 year career in engineering and sales and marketing management um, before, as I half jokingly say, I threw away a perfectly lucrative career to <laughs> then make my life in the fire service. Um, and, um, you know, the reality of that is um, I credit Lori, my wife, with all of that because it was an enormous leap of faith at a time when we had young children. Um, but it's paid off in dividends. Uh, as a result of it. And I spent the next 20 years uh, in that career, um, as you shared, responsible for a large county-based uh, fire and emergency services, served as um, more than just deputy fire coordinator, but as an emergency manager and in a community where um, 
uh, thanks to Mother Nature and other man-made incidents, we got more than our fair share of opportunities to get good at what we did. Yeah. Um, and um, so I've always been blessed with just uh, tremendous opportunities that have turned into absolutely unbelievable experiences. And, and now through first arriving, I get to help people on such a larger scale uh, be successful. And uh, I'm simply marketing the, the product I love the most, and that's the fire service. Mm. So very blessed that way. Amazing how those stepping stones, right, just lead us right to the path we're meant to be. Yeah. And everything that we need to be successful is is there. <laughs> you know, it's just right. there because we just if you take the lead. If you what? If you take the if, lead. If you take the lead. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, you're bringing up such an important um, really point of discussion here. And what was coming through my mind was that, you know, we think about, we think very often about those on the front lines um, and those first responders, like in this role of being the hero, right? And showing up and, you know, being the savior in some in some cases and doing whatever needs to be done in order to keep people safe and property safe and all of that but we rarely think about the effects of the job on that person on them as a soul on them as a spirit on them as a husband a wife a father a brother, um, a sister, right? So we forget that they also have these family positions, they have community positions, they have um, positions that we don't orient our perspective towards. We just sort of see them as there for us, seriously, right? We mm -hmm. depend on them to be there for us. But there is a cost. There is a cost for that work. You know, and this is not to make comparisons, but I, the thought is, is, you know, when somebody is, um, for instance, away uh, in, in a service oriented position, like being at war or something, and they come back, we know that they have very often a tough time reorienting to society. Mm -hmm. But what about the first responders, the frontliners who have this job relentlessly? There's no end to it until either it is their demise, unfortunately, or they just simply can't do the job anymore. What are some of the long-term effects that our frontliners, our first responders, may experience? Well, um, to give you some perspective, on average, this is average, certainly taking 9-11 out of the equation, um, we typically lose about 100 firefighters a year in the line of duty. Is that the physically or? Physically. We lose, we lose 100 firefighters in the line of duty. They die. And um, on average, st statistically, more than 50% of them die of heart attacks or other cardiac issues. So it's very easy to make the connection between what we do physically, but also mentally and emotionally, and the physical stress that that takes on our bodies, which manifests itself, for in one example, in cardiac issues and heart attacks and cardiac arrests. So there's that. Um, certainly there's um, more attention today on the whole person than just the physical being um, and looking at uh, overall health and mental wellness, mm -hmm. um, dealing with the stressors of uh, the things that we're exposed to that, as I say, you know, in, in, um, in other companies, so to speak, that, uh, that no human being should ever have to be exposed to. Yes. Um, but we are, and we absorb that. And, um, you know, sometimes we can deflect it. Sometimes we can uh, toss it aside and other times we absorb it and carry it with us. Um, so 
Um, you know, post-traumatic stress is as significant in our industry and in our profession as it is in several others. Um, there have been years of late uh, where statistically, again, we've lost more firefighters to suicide than we did in the line of duty of actually performing their jobs. So, um, you know, th that's those numbers, again, statistically, uh, may be affected by the fact that we're paying closer to it, attention to it. We're actually um, <clears throat> tracking those types of events as opposed to, uh, you know, remaining to be in denial and saying that the two weren't connected or, you know, even bringing to light how the person died, things of that nature. So um, there's emphasis in identification. There's emphasis on, uh, most importantly, preparation and prevention. Um, as well as outreach and uh, uh, just trying to connect the dots of what brings somebody to that point and, and hopefully preventing it before it does. So, but uh, there's a whole, um, there's a huge cultural shift in, that's taking place. It's, it's like any cultural sh shift, it's, it's slow, right? But uh, it is gaining momentum and that is um, steering away from the you know proverbial suck it up buttercup mm -hmm. uh, attitude towards the stressors that we're impacted by uh, that you simply can't help but be impacted by and sometimes you don't even know how you're being impacted by them uh, towards uh, saying that it's okay to say that you're not okay right and uh, so one of the one of the key phrases of that is is speak out reach out so, um, you know, speak out about the subject. Um, and if you find yourself having, uh, you know, thoughts of harming yourself or just coming to the realization that, you know, there's just something here that uh, is not working for me and I need to do something about it, then to reach out in those instances as well. I know that you've had... Um many experiences where you have been, um, you know, in contact with those who have been reacting to these kinds of stressors. Um, and certainly throughout all of your years, being able to see the progress that is being made and yet still witnessing that there's so much work to be done in order to support our frontliners. Um, I know you shared with me some just incredible stories of how you found indirectly that you had been such a powerful pillar of strength. And in fact, I know that at least one, you know, attributed his being alive to you being there for him in such an even indirect way. Would you mind sharing that? Sure. Um, it dates back to uh, 2016 when I was um, teaching at the National Volunteer Fire Council's training summit in uh, Dallas, Texas, where I listened to a presenter uh, and his co-presenter share the story um, and the gentleman's name was Scott Geiselhart. And Scott was a, a volunteer firefighter and assistant chief in uh, Frazee, Minnesota, a small town similar to the one that, you know, I grew up and live in here. Um, and um, uh, Scott was a auto mechanic shop owner, a successful businessman who over time, um, by virtue of being uh, becoming addicted to meth, uh, ruined his business, ruined his family life, and ruined his life to the point uh, which on one day he finally decided uh, the only logical outcome was to take his life. And he tells the story of sitting in his shop pulling a gun out of his desk drawer, putting it to his head, pulling the trigger, and the gun did not fire. Oh. And he was so overwhelmed and startled by that outcome that he literally threw the gun across the room. 
he sat, he cried, um, and then he started calling suicide hotlines. And I don't remember the exact number, but it was somewhere between 12 or 13 different suicide hotlines that he called that either got no answer, a busy signal, uh -huh. or an answer machine. And then he reached into his desk drawer and found a business card that his fire chief had given him some time ago that he had ignored. And it was for the National Volunteer Fire Council's Share the Load program. And he called that 800 number. And on the other end of it, uh, ironically, was a gentleman named Mike Healy. Uh, Mike is a firefighter and a fire instructor and fire chief in Rockland County, New York, um, who I've known for several years through uh, our uh, teaching cohort. Um, and Mike literally talked him down off the ledge and helped him get the help that he needs. And Mike Keeley was his co-presenter that day. And I had never met Scott before, but to hear his story, and then I had the opportunity to speak with him afterwards and spend some time. Um, then in um, September of, uh, I believe it was that same year, um, I met, met another firefighter from Rochester, New York, just down the throughway from us, uh, Jared Meeker, who was a fire chief of the uh, Lakeshore Fire Department. And he had come to our county to teach a class. And uh, we talked afterwards, we exchanged business cards and, you know, had hoped to uh, stay connected and so forth. And um, I never saw Jared again uh, until uh, in December of that same year, um, I read a newspaper article online that talked about a fire chief in Rochester who on a Sunday morning, um, driving down the street in his uh, department chief's vehicle, uh, not responding to a call, um, but just driving down the street, had a 13-year-old autistic boy run into the side of his vehicle. Mm. And uh, despite Jared's efforts and the efforts of paramedics and others, the little boy died. Oh. And I had only met Jared the one time and, and for a short time, so I didn't reach out to him then. Um, but the following spring through a uh, chance by no chance encounter. Um, I was on a plane coming home from a, the largest uh, fire conference in the United States um, on a plane full of firefighters um, where a friend of mine sitting next to me uh, offered to take a bump and he got off the plane leaving the seat open next to me and uh, the next gentleman to walk onto the plane was Jared Meeker. Wow. And he sat down next to me and um, something within me uh, gave me the courage to ask him how he was doing with obviously the traumatic consequences of being involved in a very unfortunate incident at, as he had been. Sure. And on that flight from Indianapolis to Baltimore, he shared with me in great detail how he wasn't doing with the situation mm. and uh, how he had found himself in a very dark place and was uh, really struggling to uh, deal with all the stress of it. And I asked Jared if he had ever heard Scott Geiselhardt's story, and he hadn't, and I shared that with him. And I had shared his connection to Mike Healy, another fellow New York firefighter. And um, I asked him if he had ever heard of the Share the Load program, and he had not. And I just happened to carry a challenge coin with me that has the share the load program on it and the 800 number for that. Well, we talked the entire way from Indianapolis to Baltimore and then we parted ways. He flew home to Rochester, I flew home to Buffalo from there and I never heard from Jared again. Until about three months later where I was at the New York State Fire Chiefs Conference and where Scott Geiselhart and Mike Healy were the keynote speakers. And it was afterwards sitting outside of a hospitality suite at a high top table. Uh, Jared Meeker walk up, walked up to me. And uh, if uh, you read the story on my website or see the picture, uh, you'll see he has a good foot height advantage on me. And, I, and he walks up to me and he says, I'm going to need you to stand up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, well, I'm not sure this is going to turn out that well for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I stood up and he says, I need to give you a hug. 
you mm -hmm. saved my life. And he said, I am telling you right now, had we not met before, had we not sat together on that plane, had you not told me Scott Geiselhart's story, and most importantly, had you uh, not shared with me the Share the Load program, but most importantly, had you, unlike virtually every other person, not had the courage to ask me how I was doing, I'm telling you, I would not be standing here today. So a term that we use in fire and emergency services is, is the chain of survival. All the pieces and the people that have to fall into place and the timing of it to save a life. And um, I use that term to describe all the pieces, the stars that had to fall into alignment to make those connections, to build that chain of survival from Scott Geiselhart through Mike Healy to Jared Meeker. And uh, with me, unwittingly falling in between. And um, as a result of it, I've now connected Jared Meeker and Scott Geiselhart and they teach together and collaborate. Uh, and because it's one of my skill sets, I built a website for them called seeingandcoloragain.com because Scott refers to his transformation, his post-traumatic growth as literally being able to see in color again. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just help them promote themselves so that they can share their stories with so many more people uh, <clears throat> in hopes of it being a message for hope for somebody else who, um, you know, may find themselves in, in the same situation. It's so deep, it's so moving. And it's also such a perfect example of why we need to remember that we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. We must have that personal connection in order to be able to share these life experiences because every person in the world is going to experience trauma on some level. Even more than that, Every person in the world at some time is going to rely on someone like you. You cannot escape it. And so when we start to see each other as the humans that we are and recognize that your skill set still does not make you separate from me, mm -hmm. you have the same needs and those needs are to receive the support in order to be able to allow whatever experiences you are having to, if they are, if they are challenging your emotional, mental, physical health, we need to make certain that your well-being is at the forefront of our heart and mind. Just as you look at us that way. You arrive on every single scene with that in mind. What do I need to do right now to make certain that that person survives? That person is, is leaving here in the very best way that they possibly can. What can I do? And so I want you to know that right now there are so many discussions taking place. Uh, my friend Lauren Lamore and I have been talking for months about how we can create a support system so that you're getting what you need from us. Because the truth of the matter is, I'm so thrilled to hear, honestly, that there are these programs that are being put into place. And I know that there are many more. And I I'm so thrilled to hear that you're there for each other. But you also need to have the support of the other aspects of community who you are there serving and you are there putting your life on the line for us every single day in ways we don't even know. We don't know how you are risking yourself every time that you arrive on a scene. We don't know what it's taken for you to get there. 
We don't know which parts of you you have had to put on a shelf someplace. Some that have gotten old and dusty because you're serving us. Some that you have completely forgotten about. You've forgotten about those aspects of yourself. And I just want you to know that there are people who are really awakening to your needs and that we are going to do everything that we can to make certain that not only are you honored, not only are you celebrated, but that you're supported. Because the thought to me of having like how many thousands of you, like it's countless, right, around the world that are putting really life and limb on the line every time you show up to do your, your job, are doing it often so thanklessly. Well, and, and, and certainly any firefighter or first responder will tell you, it's not the thanks that we do it for. Uh, you know, there's uh, some who may say that, you know, if you ask them the question, what do you get out of it? And, you know, their stock answer is nothing. Well, I call BS on that uh, because if you're not taking something away from it, either you're not going to be very good at it or you're not going to last long in it. Right. Because there has to be something that you take away. And, um, you know, the reality is at the end of the day, the only thing holding us together is the personal satisfaction that you made an effort to make a better, you know, better situation of what you were handed when you when you got there. Right. So uh, and um uh, you know, the harsh reality of today is uh, uh, it used to be that uh, while the uh, public's attitude towards law enforcement, for example, kind of waxed and waned and so forth, went up and down. Uh, but the firefighters were always the good guys mm. and uh, EMTs and so forth. That doesn't even hold true today. No. And, uh, you know, sometimes <clears throat> for who knows what reason or no no good reason at all, you know, we're under attack and take our risks, our, our lives at, uh, in danger um, just because there are, you know, there's an effort upon some simply to bring harm to us. So, um, but again, that's, you know, it's it's not the, the, the thanks or the accolades or, uh, you know, certainly deflect the, the use of the term hero. Um, we're just ordinary people who are put in situations where sometimes it gets a little extraordinary um but uh but that's you know it's everybody needs to take some form of you know self-satisfaction away that um, you gave some of yourself to someone else and uh and like i said some days that's the only thing we have to cling to and you know what i'm certain that there's so much fulfillment from that but I also know that there have to be times where you walk away and you say, I don't know if I can do this again, or mm -hmm. like, what am I doing here? Or I could have never imagined that it could be this bad. And mm -hmm. you've taken all that in. The fulfillment is there, but you also need to be appreciated. Sure. And I'm going to, give you my word that this will be the last, I guess the first and the last day of frontline supporters, frontline workers, first um, responders, international day that will go unnoticed on my watch. That I promise you. Sure, there's a lot of people that would appreciate that. Yes, I will make certain that there is a lot of noise and then I just want to say just one more thing, and that is the other aspect of it is that, yes, in every single circumstance where there is an emergency situation, there are heroic actions that are taking place that sometimes save that person, right, or save people, mm -hmm. um, save mm -hmm. lives. And then there are times that they don't. Right. They don't. They and can't. unfortunately, that far outweighs the, <laughs> the good outcomes sometimes. That's right. 
Yeah. And it's those that you also need to be appreciated for. Mm -hmm. Having lost my son at a scene, at an, a scene of an accident, I know how important it was for me to say thank you to those who tried their hardest. So we need to take all of this in. We need to come to a place of such mutual respect, right? Mm -hmm. We know you have respect for us. <laughs> We know you come to us with honor. And it's time now that we really started to give back. And I think also, again, particularly after this last year, and we know it's not over yet, is it? The whole thing with COVID, there are so many that are not even first responders, but second or third that are also right. affected by the right. same emergency situations. And that's what we can never forget. Mm -hmm. There is a chain of survival on both sides. On both sides. And so we need to do everything that we can to make certain that everyone's well-being is, is seen as precious as one's own. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny, I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of organizations outside of fire and emergency services, <clears throat> business organizations, community organizations, and so forth. And, and um, most often I'll lead with a little bit of tongue in cheek and I'll say, so I've made a career out of motivating people to run into burning buildings <laughs> for no remuneration. <laughs> Tell me about your business challenges. <laughs> right? What did you do today? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and most people respond, I got nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It's a great uh, encapsulation uh, of what you do. <laughs> it is. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's recruiting for the volunteer fire service. And, yeah. Oh, uh, oh, and that's another thing. Think <laughs> about how many of these people are putting their life on the line voluntarily. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They crawl out of bed at all hours yeah. of the night. I remember so yeah. many family get togethers that you were nowhere to be found. Yeah. I know, you know, that things mm -hmm. went flying when that fire whistle <laughs> went off. And yeah, so so many are doing it even without compensation. Yeah. Sorry, it um, puts you in a whole different category in terms yeah. of humanity. It yeah. really does. Yeah, I, if I, I was average, wearing a hat, it would come off to you. <laughs> Seventy to seventy-five percent of the firefighters in the United States, which there's over a million of, um, are volunteers. Could you say that again? So seventy, 70 to seventy-five percent of the more than one million firefighters in the United States are volunteer firefighters. I'm hoping everyone just took that statistic in. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in so many communities and, you know, you mentioned in my bio, I was responsible for 97 fire departments. Only three of those were paid fire departments. Two of them were combination career and are paid and volunteer and the other 92 in our county are 100 percent volunteer. And that's common in so many, you know, counties and states and, and communities. So. Uh, the volunteer fire service is, uh, you know, a uh, a form of community service like no other. And it's kind of interesting because I talk with a lot of recruiters about competition. You know, there's no lack of competition for volunteers amongst other community and civic organizations and things of that nature. But, um, you know, the reality is we should have virtually no competition for the people who are right for the job that we do. And that's because we get to do stuff that nobody else gets to do. Yeah. You know, and, and I share with them, you, you think about it, you know, in what other volunteering opportunity can you literally knock down somebody's door and they thank you afterwards? <laughs> you cut a hole in the roof and they bake you cookies. <laughs> <laughs> So it truly is a volunteering opportunity like no other, and and therefore you know the height of fulfillment as well uh, that comes with it. Um, you know, I talk about all the time that I feel bad for the people who don't get to carry this on their belt, mm -hmm. right? 
because they don't have the opportunity to connect with their community and serve and truly build a relationship with people on on a level that is just unmatched. Yeah. You know, um, I was on an EMS call uh, this summer where uh, we were attending to the the male that was having some health problems and there was a young woman in the house and um, I noticed that she was kind of like looking or staring at me and and so forth and uh, she came up to me afterwards and uh, she says I know who you are mm -hmm. I said well I apologize I don't know who you are I don't believe we've ever met and she said actually we did you delivered me on the kitchen floor of this house 21 years ago <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> your mo my mother has told me your name, and she showed me pictures of you when you've been in the news and and things of that nature. And she said, "Now I have the chance to thank you." Oh my God! And I said, "Well, that's pretty funny because I have a picture of you wrapped in a foil blanket that we put newborns in, and I remember it specifically because it was." Uh, what I remember jokingly most about that incident was it was literally on the kitchen floor. And um, there was uh, only one of our EMTs who you could tell was not a was not a father, because he was sweating bullets, and I was afraid somebody was going to drown from it. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us were calm as cucumbers, and you know, I remember sitting in the in the recliner documenting the the times between the contractions and things of that nature and so forth. So, wow. you know, every once in a while we have a win. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but, you know, it relates to the bad stories, too, where you just never know what kind of impact you're going to have on somebody. And, and you may not know it for years later, right? Or ever. So, or ever. Yeah. yeah. That, or ever. That's for sure. So, but it's. Amazing. It's, really it, amazing. It's a blessing to be able to be able to do what we do. Yeah. So, really is. Um, you mentioned very early on in our conversation about um, your podcasts. Can you tell our audience a little bit about those? Sure. Um, so uh, my primary podcast I'm involved in right now is called Ask the Recruiters. Um, and um, uh, I share that with my good friend, Matt Alto, who lives in uh, Salem, Oregon. And uh, Matt is a firefighter there and a recruiter. Uh, so we get this whole East Coast, West Coast perspective and sometimes, you know, fun battles between the two. Um, and um, it's just an open format show where we typically have a topic and a guest related to a specific strategy or tactic as it relates to volunteer recruitment or leadership. Um, and then we open up the floor for questions and comments from uh, the folks uh, around the country that uh, participate in that. And um, we just love helping people. We, we love helping, you know, them create solutions for themselves. Um, and uh, because I refer to recruitment and retention challenges with volunteers um, is very similar to a phrase that we use in incident management, and that is um, all emergencies start and end locally. Mm -hmm. They may escalate and grow, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's still a local challenge and a local issue. And re recruitment and retention challenges of volunteers are still very much the same. Yeah. They may grow, you know, to even a national level. And there's a lot of attention at that level uh, on volunteerism in the United States right now. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to what I call the trench work or the hand-to-hand -hand combat of getting them in the door and keeping them there. So, yeah. yeah. But there is no greater way to serve mm -hmm. your community than through fire and emergency services. And in my estimation, no, no more rewarding uh, opportunity as well. The, you know, what you give will come back to you many fold. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so how can people reach you? Do you mind if they email you? Sure, absolutely. What's, um, what's the best email to reach you? I use the simplest one. Uh, <laughs> tiger at first arriving dot com. Tiger at first arriving dot com. Great. And again, yeah. we'll have all of Tig's um, information here on on the page. Um, mm -hmm. There are numerous websites and his podcasts and all kinds of things that he is sharing. Um, and 
Is there anything that you would like to leave our audience with? Any last words or thoughts? Well, it's kind of along the lines of what I said earlier about I feel bad for those who don't get to carry this. And, and um, um, I feel strongly that we're not guaranteed of much, especially in our business, but the opportunity to um, encounter someone else every single day who's having a much worse day than you are. Oof. And um, that's not a burden, but a blessing. And it's a gift and it's called the gift of perspective. So if I'm having a, what I think is a bad day or, or I'm getting down on myself and I think my life sucks, this little thing goes off and reminds me that, you know what, it's not so bad because every time this goes off, it gives me the opportunity to um, try to be at my best on somebody else's worst day. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a gift. It's a gift of perspective. And sometimes in our business, you know, that is what we have to cling to every day. That's what that's what keeps us going. And uh, um, in all of my interactions, I, you know, I, I ask firefighters how they got started, how they got to where they are today. But most importantly, what keeps them going every day? And uh, for me, it's this. It's, it's that opportunity to go serve somebody else and, um, you know, be that bright light on a dark day. I love you. I love you too. I'm going to I'm going to end with one other thing and that is kind of leads into it and that is um, if you know a real firefighter we're not the ones who make the real sacrifices. Um, it's those who don't get up in the middle of the night, it's those who don't leave the dinner table, but it's those who are left behind every time the alarm bell rings offering us yet another opportunity to go and do what we love. So um, that's a constant reminder for me and for all of us that uh, Every time we get that opportunity, we have to make good decisions. We have to take the right steps. And we have to remember that uh, we have an obligation to be the best at what we do so that we can go home to those who do make the real sacrifices. It's, you know, whether you get paid for it or not, it's it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. And it's a very interrupted lifestyle. Yes, and I've, I've long said that the only thing Lori can rely on me for is to be unreliable. It's the only <laughs> thing I do consistently. <laughs> and you're very good at it. That's right. <laughs> I'm killing it. Yeah. You're killing it. Exactly. So yeah. I, I see your fire helmet there behind you. Yeah. Um, what What do you think about or or feel when you put the, that on? It just came to me, like what that must be like. Well, for one, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, this is uh, made out of leather. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually a um, one of the several very expensive leather helmets that Lori uh, gave to me as a gift as I was promoted through the fire service. Um, but um, in one of my memes that talks about who makes the real sacrifices, I talk about my three-part risk management plan. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera there, but um, written under the back lid of this is Lori. Kathleen and Alex, and uh, that's what I refer to as my three part risk management plan. Yeah. Your wife and your children. Yeah, and that's the last thing that I see before I don my last piece of battle gear, and uh, reminds me what I'm doing it for. Wow. Thank you so much for being with us, and I look forward to many more conversations. And yeah, bringing all of this to light and bringing it forward and helping to support those who support us so incredibly, really so incredibly. And um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I really thank do you. love you. Love you too. All right. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you soon. And thank you everyone for tuning in and giving us your time. And I hope that from this um, opportunity that you will look for other opportunities to serve those who serve you because there are so many ways that you can support whether it's financially whether it is the fire station whether it is being involved in their projects um, there are always ways for you to support those who support you tirelessly and so um, I hope that you'll take advantage of this inspiration and explore that and then take action because a lot of action is taken on your behalf. 
All righty. Have a wonderful day and see you again on Heart Shift Radio.